And that graph goes back to 2001. You see that water levels have gone up and down. The area shaded in red or, or orange uh, shows that drought we had from uh, 2011 to 2015. And you see that was a constant, we had constant decline over that period, seven feet. And after that, when we got all the rain in the spring 2015, the, the water level came back up and that was really good. But during that drought period, it was going down and down. So that, that shows why it's important. And this morning I mentioned that the, the Russia Spring Aquifer is very unique. It's not like Ogallala. So Ogallala does not get any recharge. It doesn't matter how much it rains. None of the rain makes it to the Ogallala. A Russia Spring is different. It is hydrologically connected. So it, it makes a big difference, and that's why it's important to be able to save that water. It's also different than folks in Altus area who rely on uh, that Lake Altus. If they leave more water in the lake, they're not sure how much of that will be available because it's going to evaporate, it's going to seep. But this groundwater here is going to be there, so you can, if we save it, it's going to be there for, for future to use. Now, the, the next plot on first page is about energy. And there's the graph out there with a simple line showing the energy cost to pump uh, water for 1,000 hours uh, going back to 2001. But there's a lot of information going into that one graph. One piece of information is the average pumping efficiency. And that number we estimated based on the test energy audits that we conducted in this area. We started from some fields north of the highway, all the way south here. We tested, we went to uh, uh, pump stations like this one behind me. Uh, we, we tested the energy efficiency. We got an average number. We used it to get this graph. We also used the uh, unit price of electricity um, that what, what we thought is what you guys pay in this, in this region. We used that and all the fluctuations from year to year. We also took into account the changes in groundwater level from year to year. And you see that number changes, but in the past several years, it's been probably between 2,500 to 3,000, maybe a little bit above that. But that's how much you pay for every 1,000 hours of irrigation. And in a season that you uh, irrigate for 2,000 hours, uh, then you can uh, multiply that number times two. So obviously, um, if you can take a look at that, if you can cut back on irrigations on pumping by, uh, let's say, 100 hours, that's how much you're going to be saving. Now, another issue blamed on agriculture in the past is the water quality in the Fort Cobb Reservoir. I'll have right there a report by U.S. Geological Survey. You can find that report online. But I have basically a few lines out of that report right below that, that figure that shows the report heading uh, that says that eutrophication in the reservoir is caused by the chemicals from the fields. The fields that we have installed the instruments at and we've looked at, we really haven't seen a whole lot of deep percolation or surface runoff that would carry the chemicals with it. Uh, but this is what this research found and reducing those uh, irrigation return flows can definitely help with some downstream uh, water resources qualities. The last one, the fourth one, is the perception of consumers. Now this is something that seems like it's growing bigger and bigger every year. If you look at the back of that uh, pack of uh, delicious peanut that you had, it says non-GMO verified. Things like that. Consumers are asking for more and more information about where that, where the food that they're consuming is coming from. Uh, what's the water footprint? Uh, there's been talks about with, with Cotton Incorporated folks about um, the push from consumers to know more, maybe asking uh, Walmart to add some uh, colored labels, green for the uh, smallest water footprint, red for the largest water footprint. So we can agree or disagree with that. We know there's a lot of misconceptions out there. We know a lot of the push is coming from the folks who probably don't know much about agriculture, they haven't spent a, a day of their life here to see how things are done here, but that's the reality. That, that push will grow bigger and bigger. So what we can do is to uh, equip ourselves with the technology that can help us uh, get there and help us answer those uh, requests and, and concerns. 
Now, one way to do it, you're using sensor technology. So the bottom of the page two, you see some of the sensor technologies that we're using. The sensors you see there have been installed in the fields in this area. The closest one is a peanut field. It's just 10 minutes drive from here. We've had this going on for three years now. We've worked with peanut growers, cotton growers, pepper growers, and corn growers in the Fort Cobb watershed area. And I can tell you, um, <coughs> uh, almost every one of them that I've talked to really love this tool. And you can probably see why if you flip to page three, you see two examples. This is the type of graph that you see if you pull up that mobile application they have or you look at the uh, website on your uh, laptop. The top one, that black line is the average soil moisture in the top 48 inches of the soil. And that green area tells you where the soil moisture needs to be. You go above the green area, you're gonna lose water to deep percolation. Uh, you go below that, that green area, you're gonna uh, lose yield due to water stress. So it, they, they kind of make it easy to manage irrigations. If you need more information, you're more interested, you can click on that top tab where it says moisture and it gives you a single line for every one of the depth. I have only half of them uh, activated to avoid the overcrowding of the lines, but you can see all the way from four inch to 48 inch, you can look at every single depth and see how soil moisture changed. Uh, we, we have uh, people looking at this after their irrigations. I had a guy told me that the irrigation applications were just not enough because they, he saw that that water flux was not moving uh, down below eight inches. So he ramped up irrigations, he watched the soil moisture dynamics, water was moving further down in the root zone. Uh, with that, he managed to probably reduce evaporation losses off of the canopy and store more of that irrigation water in the soil. Uh, last page, uh, uh, there are two similar graphs, uh, but this is a cotton field, and you see the variations in, in soil moisture towards the end of the period where we had the moisture uh, data coming in. You see that uh, this, this guy went above, uh, just a slightly above the green zone, so th that's probably some irrigations that could be avoided or reduced right there along with the energy cost and everything else that we already talked about it. So that's one technology out there. Then we have an interesting project going on in, in around Altus area with some of the cotton growers there. And that very last graph at the bottom of page four is about that. Now this company out of Australia, they, they, their sensor looks at canopy temperature. And they're saying that kind of similar to soil moisture, if the crop is under a stress, it's gonna get hotter and hotter because it's not gonna be able to transpire, so it's not gonna cool itself down. And what they do is the line you see that goes up and down, the kind of brown line, is the canopy temperature of the crop. And then the, the pink uh, area, shaded area, is a stress indicator they estimate. And when that stress indicator reaches a threshold, it's time to irrigate. And the good thing about that is it, it kind of integrates everything that's going on in the soil. If you had a rainfall event, all of that is included in there. We have six cotton fields under different types of irrigation systems, sprinkler, drip, flood, uh, around Altus area, equipped with this technology. We're monitoring all of those. Uh, we're recording data, uh, data availability, sensor reliability, all of that, and we're gonna report on that. We've also talked to um, NRCS offices about uh, providing equip cost share. I think, uh, I'm not sure, I, I haven't visited with them uh, recently, but they were planning to include soil moisture sensors as part of the EQIP um, cost share program. Um, if that's the case, you can benefit from that as well. The last thing I wanna talk about is, in addition to the energy audits that I talked about, we did a lot of irrigation uniformity studies in this region. Now, what we did is, uh, in a center pivot like this, we would uh, lay out catch cans under the nozzles, and we see how uniformly water was applied. Um, a lot of the fields were doing good, but we saw a lot of non-uniformities. And where we saw non-uniformities, it was because the nozzle was plugged, or it was broken, or it was a wrong uh, nozzle. I think in one case, two spans were switched in terms of uh, nozzles, the, the right number of nozzle, the, the um, type of nozzle that should be there. I don't know how that happened, but they're probably reading the chart and they read it wrong. 
Uh, so that was something that could be fixed. So that's something to pay attention to, especially as you uh, end this irrigation season and try to winterize your system. So just pay attention to that, the maintenance. If you have a, a sand trap and you clean that up, make sure you put it back on and you don't leave it open. Uh, just paying uh, attention to all the maintenance as you go uh, through the end of the irrigation season and get ready for the next season.